just listen to the stories that that our grandparents and our you know our, our great grandparents, if any of them are still around, are telling. Mm. Just spend some time in that, and that's that's enough. Mm. Dr. David Favai, that's a blessing and a privilege to have you uh, join us this morning to kind of share uh, your insights and what your diary looks like as an Indigenous PhD scholar here in Aotearoa. Um, I'll get you to introduce yourself, bro, and uh, your name, country of origin, um, family, and then we'll get into some of the, the nitty-gritty questions that I've got for you as well. Malo, Malo Edmund, uh, David Daufumi Katafaavai. I am uh, Tongan, um, but I also have heritage links to Samoa. Uh, I was born in Niue, so I, I also have a connection to Niue. And uh forgot the other part of the, the Fam- question. Family. Family, originally, as I, as I mentioned, Tonga. Uh, we moved across to New Zealand in 1986. Uh, slowly, the the whole Kainga moved across. A couple of my uncles left to the states. Uh, a few tried to go over to the states, but were unsuccessful. And then, only recently, my immediate sort of my parents and my siblings have gone across to Australia, mm. and I'm the only one uh, back in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Mm. You, you've identified the three countries in the Pacific. Identity is a big thing within our young people today, and particularly where we have a, a lot of young people who have uh, various identities, particularly of ethnic. How do you navigate that, being Tongan, Samoa, New um in, in, a, in a country like New Zealand? Mm. We're going, we're going. Oh, we're going straight into the deep stuff now, like <laughs> identity, um, particularly with our Pacific young people. Yeah. It, it, it's really important mm. to, because identity kind of um, assumes that, you know, that a, a person carries all these senses of belonging mm. to places and people. Um, but the problem, the challenge with it is that you might have your own understanding of it, mm. but then others impose a kind of, you know, their own identity structures on you. Mm. And so the struggle for our young people is um, now, and, and I think our generation now are a lot stronger than my generation. So I went through high school in the sort of the early mid-90s um, and just what it means to be Tongan at the time was often, you know, race was kind of that first instant, oh, yeah brown person must be from the Pacific. If you speak the language, if you speak the Tongan language, I left Tonga, then you're Tongan. Mm. But now it's not so simple anymore. Um, and so these intersections of how, you know, the color of skin, a person's um, fluency in a language, the their grandparents, whether they're New Zealand born or born in, in the islands, all of those kind of shape the way that a person identifies, a young person identifies him or herself or their self. Um, but it's it's not a, a fixed thing. Mm. It could change depending on, you know, um, a particular time, depends on who that person is with. So identity is important, yes. But now it's, you know, it's about understanding how it shifts and changes across places and and with groups of people. What would your message be to our young people who will be traversing the space of navigating their identity in New Zealand to someone who's similar to your background? Mm-hmm. Uh, what would your what would your message be to them and how to navigate that space? Yeah, the the key message for our young people is that um, you are enough, because um, quite often, you know. Uh, half this, half that, quarter this, quarter that can kind of quantify and and make someone feel as though they're not enough of some something. Mm. Um, and so the message, the key message is to our young people, you're enough. You know, know your stories, know your papa, and you're enough. 
that that's about you know making making them understand that it's important to trace do the tracing back even if they don't know the language go back to the the names of people the names of places and just listen to the stories that that our grandparents and our you know our, our great grandparents if any of them are still around are telling mm. just spend some time in that and that's that's enough mm. yes. who was a question that I usually ask young people when I'm at schools is, is, a, is a simple question, but they can go in a very deep and meaningful way. The question is that I'm asking, who is your motivation in life? Mm. For me, it's a handful of people. It, it, I can't account that or, or sort of put that on one person. There have been key people across time that have shaped who I am and not just people but an understanding of of a higher being beyond us. That, you know, that it's not all about us but there are other things that exist outside. And God, people in your name God and name a kind of deity that they connect with. And when you have that kind of understanding, you you move away from just fix, being fixed on you, and, and it's an understanding that you know it's about how do you connect to other things mm. and other people um, and other places. And my grandparents were instrumental. My grandfather, particularly my grandmother, who was around um, when my grandfather passed away, and I was about I think I was about eleven. Yeah, 10, 10 at the time. Um, and it was a time where, because I live with rheumatic heart disease, um, it was a time where I was diagnosed with, with rheumatic heart disease and then I had my first surgery um, and I went into, I was at Middlemore Hospital, then went across to Green Lane Hospital. I still remember it, floor six was the floor that a lot of the young our young kids with who were kind of in the worst case of rheumatic heart disease and had to have surgery and um, and things like that. So I had my surgery, recovered for a little bit, and then three days after my birthday, it was my grandfather's burial. And I had no idea, no idea that he had passed. And I was getting ready because the nurses were getting ready to do a birthday cake, you know, um, as as they they did back in the hospital, and it was, it, Mum walked in. I still remember that day. Mum walked in, not her usual self, and and you know I I was pretty you know excited getting ready for the the birthday uh, celebration, and a lot of the time Mum was Mum's head was down, so I figured something was up, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. She went outside, spoke with the nurses, and and I could see heads, you know, sort of going up and down, and and I was still wondering what you know what was going on, um, but I hadn't I hadn't focused too much on that. A couple of minutes later, nurse came, um, told me that I had to get ready, just put on some clothes because I was going to go out with my parents, um, and it wasn't until sort of pushed in the wheelchair, the only piece of clothing I had um, or a shirt I had was a blue, a blue kind of aloha. You know, bright, bright as blue aloha that, that my nana made. I didn't really want to wear it, but because it, it sort of stuck out, you know, out of everything that was around, it stuck out and put it on. Mum was in black, but I still didn't, hadn't figured it out yet. Got into the car Dad was in black. And until I made that kind of association, I knew something was up. Something, you know, mm. something was up. And so quiet, sort of a quiet drive down to to Royal Oak. Um, and it, it past Royal Oak down to where the Onehanga town centre. They're close to the Methodist church. Mm. There's a funeral place there, and that's where I saw a whole lot of family, just people I 
you know, remember growing up with all in black, all in their tawanga and, and tawala and things. And I knew something was up, but I didn't know whose, you know, whose funeral it was. And until I kind of got closer, they had pushed me in the wheelchair and I stuck out. That was a memory. I stuck out. Everybody was in black and I was in this blue aloha. And I have this photo that, that mum keeps. But I just remember I, it still hadn't kicked in yet. My mind was on the birthday. You know, I wanted to get back to the hospital. But also the fact that, you know, everybody was grieving. Mm. But I hadn't, you know, I hadn't connected with that yet. And it wasn't until I saw the coffin and asked, who go you? And I saw the photo. And it was granddad's photo and spent a bit of time just trying to download everything. You know, what what was this all about? And and could I have, you know, was there something that I could have done to sort of, you know, keep him around? Because he, he was really important to me. And and also to my cousins and my, my dad and his brothers. Um, and it wasn't until I got back to the hospital that I grieved, you know, didn't have time to, to do it there, didn't know how to do it well there, and it wasn't until I got back into the hospital mm. that I thought, oh, he's actually gone. Mm. Yeah, this is, and you just, I mean, things like that, you... And I keep thinking about our young people here. How many are going through things but haven't been able to to um, process it? Mm. And then they go into schools and schools have their own expectations of them. Um, and which spaces will allow them to grieve and process mm. those things? Um, and I have to be honest, as a as an educator, as a teacher in, in Aotearoa New Zealand schools, our schooling spaces, Places and spaces are don't always allow for people to, you know, mm. heal or deal with things. Mm. Absolutely. Thank you for for sharing that. I know that comes from a, a very, very sacred space um, for a lot of, particularly for men. Mm. Who usually, we, you know, we usually don't share emotions and 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 heartfelt stories like that. And you know, for just. The fact that you shared it here, is, it means a lot. What I'm going to get you to do now is to ignore me, but look down this camera here. And had, if you had the opportunity to to acknowledge your grandfather, acknowledge your grandmother, what would you say to them in making you the person that you are today now? It's quite a... Quite a task. Um, if they were behind the camera and looking, what I would say to them is um, yeah, just huge, massive thank you. Just for being you, I think that was that's enough. That was enough to sort of guide me along the way and yeah I'm. I'm uh, I, I'm always my fan when I whenever I, I engage in, in these kinds of stories because they shape they have shaped me and continue to shape me. Um, we have a son. I think there was always something that I wanted to share with my grandparents. And he's in high school. Um, 
a lot like me. <laughs> Probably a little, a little annoying. Um, but he's good. He's kind of, you know. <sighs> sort of trying to share what you've taught and kind of passed on uh, with him and and your other great grandchildren, my nephews and nieces who are uh, somewhat distant now in Australia. Um, but the heart is always trying to remember and kind of fulfill the the things that were shared by you. Um, you know, not always as good and as well as, as you had shown me, but but we try. I think that's the key is just to try. Mm. Thanks, bro. Thanks for doing that. One day, um, you know, we'll eventually get older and we'll reflect on, reflect mm. on this. And uh, one day you're going to be a grandfather. And the message that you've just shared will eventually uh, play a big part in the next generation to come, which is amazing. You know, that's a cool part of these kind of stuff that we're doing is imparting knowledge and also ideas that we can leave when we eventually leave this world, and we know for sure that the next generation will come, and it'll be a better place for them. So, uh, yeah, no, thanks for sharing that. Let's get back to the topic, bro. What does your diary look like? What does your diary look like on a on a daily as a, as a PhD scholar here in New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. The my normal day um, is about making sure that I'm healthy. Um. And and I've kind of learned to switch my priorities now. Um, last year, the priority was around trying to fulfill and be around for, you know, for people outside of my family um, and fight the battles that needed to be fought because they're not a, they're, there aren't many of us around and we're scattered across, you know, academia, across universities and disciplinary spaces. Um, but now my diary sort of this year mainly has been around making sure that I'm healthy to be able to do those things um, and making sure that my son is ready off for school and that he's mentally all good to go. Make sure that my wife is all good before she goes off to work. Um, and then I get myself ready, you know, because I, I am mentally ready, then into work. And mm. and that can take me up until 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, but there's always breaks in between so that I fulfill my father's responsibility, um, take picking up my wife from work because she, she can't drive. Um, anymore or until things are sorted with her and also taking Nella to his uh, extracurricular things. Mm. Um, so there's, you know, breaks in between where I do I do that and it's been, been about prioritising the things that are necessary in order to fight those fights with the structures that, that we're in. Mm. Um, and it makes makes me mentally fit. Um, to do those things, to stay up until two in the morning. Um, whereas in the past it was a different pattern and, and it was unsustainable uh, and it made me unwell. Mm. Yeah. We'll come back to the uh, the structures and, and all that kind of stuff later. But um, this time, can you share um, what your PhD research was all about briefly? Um, and then I've got some... So questions on, because you, you know I, I refer to you as the the, the mix between Doctor Agustino Mahina 
and Dr. Timote Violetti, um, two, two amazing thinkers in our Tongan societies and also Pacific and Oceania as well, and how they've framed and uh, shaped a lot of our thinking today, and particularly in the space of academia. So, um, but we'll get back to that later. But I'll, I'll get you to kind of share briefly um, what your PhD research was all about. Yeah, cool. The it was a really, really difficult um, decision to what sort of topic to focus on because uh, schools were telling you what their needs were um, and then university sort of trained you in a certain way so that you're still philosophically deep and invested in trying to inquire into the phenomena or the problem or the issue so that, you know, you can see it from multiple perspectives or multiple angles. Um, so I was trying to find a topic that would be long-lasting that others can pick up later on and build on rather than a topic that was about fixing a particular problem at that time at a school site or structure, which will change because we know that the structure, um, the structure of the Western academe or, or the dominant Western schooling system changes um, as society and things change around it. Um, so my topic was originally going was originally around um, looking at the 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 way that cultural capital shapes um, the reproduction of knowledge in the schooling system in in a South Auckland school uh, where predominantly you know Pacific was the population within schools. Um, it wasn't until sort of my second year that the topic was sharpened, and that was because I had a, a Tongan supervisor jump on board. Um, and what she did, and, and I'll name her um, because she was influential, Linda Manuatu, alongside uh, Alison Jones, who was well respected in the in education and sociology, um, was about looking at the intergenerational knowledges that were um, that are valued by by families and uh, deliberately transmitted, shared, imparted to the next generation. And then how does the next generation operationalize those kinds of knowledges in the schooling system and in the community? So I had a, had a bigger focus. Um, and because I'm all, you know, I valued my grandparents and what they shared and my parents and their generation and what they shared um, – I also had an investment in the next generation because that's what, you know, growing up in that system taught me to value, that it's not just about me, it's about those who've, you know, similar to you, mm. those who who have come before um, and those that are to come or to follow. Um, mine was still sitting in that kind of frame. You know, this isn't just about me, this is about the next generation as well and mm making sure that they benefit from what was shared to us. Um, I took that across Tonga and different sites in Tonga. Sites meaning went to a, a grandfather, father, grandsons in a, you know, in sort of a business, family business, sort of um, commercial sector kind of area, the way that they shaped their koloa, I mm. tangata you know, the things that they that, that were worthwhile and mattered to them. And then went across to another family who was quite, who lived out in the the rural area, and how they valued teaching. And every generation there was the story of, you know, the, the original person that went through teaching and why teaching mattered to them and then how they carried and enacted and operationalized those you know, those kinds of knowledges. Um, and that was in Tonga versus families in, in New Zealand as well. But I really appreciated the, the way that families showed the things that they shared, how they dealt with different people, you know, different generations. And it wasn't just one generation's responsibility, but the another generation would look at it and see the challenge and then intervene. 
So I, I appreciated that because mm. I never thought of it that way, you know, that, you know, that, that multiple generations were fulfilling their responsibilities in multiple ways. Mm. That, that was massive to, to see and to also appreciate. Um, and that, so that's how, how mm. the topic kind of. Nice. Yeah. So uh, for those who are tuning in and uh, you are wanting, um, maybe you're in the early PhD journey, um, it's good to bounce ideas, particularly of people of your background and, and who understands your culture. And as we hear here with uh, Dr. Fawai, who um, reached out to Dr. Manwatu and sharpened up the topic to what it is today. And it's, a, it's amazing to see the work that you've done. I wanted to talk about your method. Uh, and and the, you published a paper that's almost become the paper that everyone is reading at the moment and citing Talanoa'i ai Talanoa, or something along those lines. Mm. I think it was a 2017-18 paper that you published uh, with your supervisors. And it's, I believe, it's one of the only papers that, that talks about Talanoa research method, but in an application way. Because everyone talks about it around just conducting the Talanoa, or the data collection, and that's it. Mm. But no one actually talks about the application of it in a way that you have um, written about it. And it's amazing to see how much people have used your your paper and also your method in a way that it makes sense to us. Because when it first came out uh, by Dr. Violetti in 2006, it was it was the thing that everyone mm-hmm. was was talking about. You know, it was, every, it was this method that made sense to us because we did it on a daily basis without us knowing it can become a research method in Western research. Mm. Today, everyone is using it. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions that may be controversial, <laughs> but I want you to talk, to share some insights regarding that paper that you published mm. and how you, um, yeah, your thoughts around the application around it. Yeah. I I, I like what you said, how, how um, Violetti did, to sort of build that grounding eh, for for Talanoa to to be sort of portrayed and told in that way as a as an applicable or a valid um, method for Pacific people, um, and he he framed it at that point in time. And I want to make reference that it was done at that point in time. Um, and for him, who is well versed in the language, well versed in the practice of Talanoa. Um, and so this is a, I always, this is what doing intergenerational research does, or did to me at least, was to think of how relevant these these methods and these concepts are over time and, you know, and context, because context changes. Um, I was fortunate to be in Te Punawananga, the School of Indigenous, Māori and Indigenous Studies in the Faculty of Education and Social Work because they were they were encouraging those kinds of thinking, um, and and I I loved it because we were able to critique. Now, universities are good at, at at you know encouraging people to critique, but sometimes you lose spirit, you know, the spirit of generosity and care when you critique, because it's always a competitive kind of environment. But we were in an environment where we were allowed to to think critically, but not lose spirit, you know, and, and not make others feel or bad, you know, undermine them. Criticality shouldn't be that way. You, We should be able to talanoa, talanoa'i, and still uphold our, our mana together. Eh? And I, I appreciated that space. But I wanted to... to a lot of it was realizing after the realizations came after I did it because the, the way that it was described by Violetti and a few others are like CBC, James Prescott um, and, and even your know, Stephen Halapu and, and some of his stuff. It was idealized it framed that if you do it this way um, and you think of this value, it'll, it'll look like this. I tried it that way. <laughs> it, it did not evoke the same 
experience that Violetti and them talked about in their papers. And so I thought, this is helpful, but I can't write it in that same tone like they do because others are going to come in, you know, and feel that Talanoa didn't live up to the way that they thought it would. And so telling that story was really important as a key learning from the PhD. Um, and my supervisors were quite supportive. Alison Jones was really influential in the way that she got me thinking about how to share, you know, my my struggles, mm. the dilemmas that I I caught it at the time. But I kept thinking of the next, you know, I, I told Tangata Hoko, like they shouldn't be be made to feel mm. like they can't do it because it was the same as me, I, not to the level that Violetti them were able to conceptualize it. Um, but yeah, it was tough, mm. tough time, but I was in the right space, mm. right school, right people around me to to shape that. Mm. Amazing. Um, a question that I usually ask everyone, Red, who, 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 who may want to employ Talanoa as a research method is a really simple one. If they can differentiate the difference between Talanoa and interview. Now in your views, what's the difference, particularly to help not, not our Pacific researchers, mm. but also our non-Pacific researchers to really understand the essence of Talanoa and, 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 how, and what, how and also why we use it and Pacific research methods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you are to differentiate the two, if you are willing to explore something with someone and genuinely, Talanoa is the way. If you want to just extract something and you know what you're looking for, don't do Talanoa. Do an interview. So the, the the difference in the two is that Talanoa requires one to be, to release some of the, unsettle some of those preconceived ideas that they have so that they can connect. Um, because if you don't do any of that, you're, it's just going to look like an interview. So you need to do some of that unsettling um, and unlearning I think that's that's mm. kind of key to always thinking: is mm. Dalanoa right for this this uh, work or not? Mm. Mm. Cool. Two key words that I've just learned today: un unsettling and unlearning. Which is some is some two key words that I that it's a very struggle to do at home. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's it's important, and, and particularly in the field of research, because we as Pacific people don't like to unsettle. We, as Pacific people, don't like to unlearn. But in order, like like you said, in order to, if we're going to write about Dalanoa, if we're going to use Dalanoa as our data collection method, then we have to unsettle and unlearn ourselves in order to really engage and nurture that relationship between us and our participants. And and so, now that that's, that's, that makes a lot of sense, and, and, and particularly particularly with a lot of our researchers coming up and using Dalanoa for the sake of using Dalanoa. Mm. You know, that's that's the challenge that we're having at the moment. And so going back back going back to two thousand three or nineteen ninety nine, when Linda Tuway Smith talks about decolonizing methodologies. Today, do you think we are at a stage where we have to decolonize Pacific research methodologies? Short answer to that is yes. And the reason why we should do it is every and it goes back to to time and and time and context. We're seeing more of these Pacific methodologies named. Mm. They're being named. Um and every time you read them you're wondering you know, what what's what have they learned from it? Um, what's different, and also how can the next generation 
learn from this. Mm. A generation that we don't know what they're going to look like. We don't know what their challenges are. And so does the way that that these specific methodologies and methods frame themselves, is it going to, you know, see possibilities for the next generation? So I keep thinking about if you're naming it, how are you doing it differently? Are you acknowledging the whakapapa? Or if you're not acknowledging the whakapapa, then obviously it's you're just adding clutter, which is what Tui Atua reminds us. You know, we, we've got a declutter, which means we have to trace its whakapapa, make links with that, and then articulate how we're doing it. Mm. And how we're doing it differently with the people. Yeah, the, mm. the particular people which bring ho- whole lots of dimensions of difference and specificities. Um, because not all Pacific are the same. Mm. Not all Tongans are the same. And you have to appreciate the fact that these dimensions of specificities can shape the way that you do any kind of, you know, um, method, method or methodology. Um, and I keep thinking, yeah, what's different? Not the sake of, not for the sake of just looking for difference, mm. but what's different that you can share and highlight for the next generation so that they can connect with it. Um, those are kind of the things that I, I sort of look for. And even students I supervise, is I ask them, why are you doing it? Is, mm. You know, you're, you're seeing it, but how, what's different? And is it going to connect with the next generation that's going to read your work? With COVID-19 um, pandemic um, entering our country and also our communities, has that allowed us has that given us space to uh, redefine our methods and methodologies, and particularly in particular the ways we engage with our people, i.e. the use of technology, mm-hmm. and whether that's now an opportunity for Pacific peoples to weave in digital technologies to collect data, analyze data, and also disseminate data that we now see in a way that's very different from we used to disseminate data, mm. particularly with the rise of social media. We, where do you see our Pacific research in the future moving? Like from, from now on, and particularly with the the, the introduction of digital te- technologies, mm. it, it's really important for for Pacific researchers to to understand the online space as a possible space that shapes the way we conduct research. If you look at Facebook, our Pacific people are engaging in Facebook in various ways and not always pleasant, mm. you know, not, not in pleasant ways. And you relationships, connections, look, feel, sound different in that online space. You have vahaupi. The conversations are different. The, the way that you... You know, you get to Māori and Māwhana is different. Mm. Um, so you don't have those those sort of felt connections easily when you're like this, yeah, in person, and the proximity from person to person, um, va shapes it, you know, can, can be shaped. But when you've got these online digital tools, there's, there's a vast distance that has to be, Travelled or traversed before you can get to Māori and Māwhana, and, and there are certain ways that you, you know, things you have to do in there. So I think Pacific researchers have to to consider that as a space which constructs and reconstructs our methods, yeah, of, in, in ways that still honour honour the our values that we we value, mm. and those principles of ethics. That, that our communities, you know, thrive on um, and encourage. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, again, it's a, it's a very interesting space to to be in. But you know, right now in the research domain that we're in at the moment is we're always thinking of uh, innovative ways on how we can disseminate our research uh, and the next generation to come. 
it's going to be even more challenging, mm-hmm. um, but also more exciting to see what ways are they going to come up with to disseminate their own research. Um, hey, we're, we're almost coming to the end, but I, I, I guess I, at this time, um, if you, what, what projects are you working on? What's your, what's your current job at the moment? And, um, yeah, if there was a last message that you'd like to leave behind for Pacific researchers um, in the field. Yeah. Mahalo. The, I've, I used to be at the, at the University of Waikato School of Education uh, full time, but I've now come across to Pacific Health at Auckland. Um, I'm there for a year and uh, the whole reason for that is to get closer with, you know, be physically closer to my, my wife and son and, and be around for them um, when they need me. Um, health is an interesting space, and I can see commonalities between the health system and the education system in Aotearoa, New Zealand. You sort of see those remnants of colonial, you know, um, sort of structures and the way that, that processes are done. You you can sort of feel it, mm. that there are those, those tensions in there. And... Coming across there, I know that there is a need for building the the Pacific research space um, in Pacific Health at Auckland, and, and they've identified that. I didn't go in there saying that. They've identified that, and my responsibility is, is to help sort of unfold a few things for them. Um, that's been good. I, yeah, the the work that's kind of, um, keeping me busy at the moment is the development of NCA Pacific Studies. I kind of want to see that project run well, um, designing their achievement standards, their internal assessments, external assessments, um, because my son's going through high school now and hopefully he'll, you know, he'll hear its development and maybe, I don't know whether he'll be able to do it, but at least, you know, the next generation after him will have that opportunity. Um, also, one on my mind is is rheumatic heart disease. Uh, it's kind of a silent killer. It's a silent subject that that schools don't talk about, young people, communities, church don't talk about. Um, but it's prevalent. It's there. So for one who lives with it, I, I want to head into that space. Um because we don't know how long we'll be around and it, it just feels, feels like it's the time. feels right. The message for the next generation is be in community. As hard as that may be, and we know what that's like with our, our older generation, our, our generation and those to come, there's a, it's difficult, it's challenging. But what the, the, what our experiences have showed us is that there are key gold nuggets that our older generations share. And if we're not around to hear those things, the good and the bad, you know, we miss out. And we're the ones that are connecting those stories mm. with the next. So if we're not around, the gap for the next generation is bigger in trying to make sense of those stories the good and the bad. So I think it's really important to be in community and just develop the, I think when you're around with more than just yourself or you and another person, you have more people to turn to, more people to share your challenges, um, your frustrations, because there's many, and even the hopeful, hopeful things. So that's my key message is be in community, just stick it out. Because mm. You know, the gap's wider when generations mm. are missing. Yeah. Dr. David Favai, thank you so much for taking the time to come out and share insights, experiences, ideas that will one day make a big difference within the communities that we serve and care for on a daily. Um, that's the message that he's left behind, be in community and, and for those researchers out there who want to be in the community, remember, it's your job to voice the voiceless in our communities to ensure that there are pathways in the generation that, um, that are about to come after us 
has a better lifestyle and better opportunities for them that one day they will grow into. So again, thank you, Dr. Favai, for the best. And uh, we we'll look forward to catching up soon. Kia ora. Hello.